everyone. It's Duncan Crary. You're listening to The Kunstlercast, a weekly conversation about the tragic comedy of suburban sprawl featuring James Howard Kunstler. Jim is the author of The Long Emergency, The Geography of Nowhere, and The World Made by Hand novels. For today's show, I'm going to go back into the Kunstlercast vault to replay one of my favorite shows, although I have touched it up a little bit since the first broadcast in 2008. This is a show in which Jim and I talk about his paintings of the modern American landscape. And I thought it would be appropriate to play this show this week because Jim currently has artwork hanging in two group art exhibitions that are going on right now. This Sunday, there's an opening for one of those group shows at Gallery 668 in Greenwich, New York. The party begins Sunday, August 7, from 4 to 6 p.m. You can learn more at gallery668.com. You can also check out Jim's paintings hanging in the Boscobel Exhibition Gallery in Garrison, New York, downstate, through September 15. And you can learn more about that at boscobel.org. That's B-O-S-C-O-B-E-L. And lastly, I do want to announce that I am currently working to create a cafe press store in which you can buy products that have Jim's paintings on them, coffee mugs, posters, postcards. They have little quotes from things that Jim said during this podcast on them as well. I'm not quite ready to open that online store up to the public, but I will announce that on this podcast when it's ready to go, and there'll be links on Jim's website as well as the podcast website. As I've done in the past, I'm releasing two versions of this episode. One is an audio-only version. The other is an enhanced show that you can watch only in iTunes and see the pictures of Jim's paintings display as we talk. For those who can't take advantage of that, I've posted a link where you can view Jim's paintings online. Jim, I've heard from a lot of our listeners who imagine that we're in a studio, but we're, we're actually in your home office. Yeah, well, it's sort of like a studio, you know. It, it's a professional place <laughs> where, you know, good things happen. Well, if I can describe Sometimes. to some of the listeners, hanging on the wall are paintings of a burned-out car, uh, kind of a somewhat dilapidated streetscape, and some, um, you know, a car on a sort of a country, high, you know, cars on the road, painting, very beautiful paintings of Cars on the road. That's and, not all that's in here. But. <laughs> well, I'm selectively picking them out, yeah. but I think people might be surprised to know that you spend a lot of time painting the American landscape, which includes a lot of paintings of uh, parking lots and Mc- McDonald's and mobile stations. Can, can you tell me, I, when I first learned that you were a painter and I saw some of your paintings, I was really surprised at the subjects that you choose to paint. Well, it sh- maybe it shouldn't be a surprise. I, I, I've really painted in my whole life, and uh, you know, I went to a special school in New York City called the High School of Music and Art, where we received a fair amount of decent training. And I wasn't uh, fabulous, but it was okay. And, uh, you know, it's something I've sort of carried on in the background of my life uh, forever. And I take it seriously. I do get out a lot. I, I'm I, what's called sort of a sur le motif painter. I go out to the motif, you know, with my French easel. It speaks French. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it's a box that unfolds into an easel and I'm, I'm out there with the subject matter in in the uh the field and i'm interested in the landscape of our time and the landscape of our time is mostly you know about the highway uh van gogh painted the peasants sleeping next to the haystacks because he he, he was in a landscape that was populated with human beings you know i'm in a landscape that's populated mostly by automobiles so you know i paint them Edward Hopper did something similar, although, you know, we look at Hopper's paintings today, his paintings from the, the 1920s and the 30s when he, he was doing a lot of his highway stuff. And, you know, we recognize that as a landscape that is now bygone, you know, because the scale of it is smaller and it's, it all seems kind of quaint. Uh, you know, it's not as overwhelming as what we've got. But um, I'm very interested in it. Now, there's some additional things about it that, that people who haven't tried this might not know, but... Um, it is very hard to see what you're looking at out there on a commercial highway strip, you know, with all the, the contesting signage and all the sort of visual clutter. And so it becomes a great challenge to be able to make it legible. And that's one of the things that I like about painting the highway strip. Um, I also got really interested as I was going out there um, in the contrast between the natural light and the artificial light, especially, you know, at sundown. So I would go out and, you know, set my easel up, uh, let's say in the, uh, in the juniper shrub bed of the Burger King 
you know, painting the Kmart a quarter of a mile away, you know, with the sun going down, you know, in a certain way. So that the, you know, the, the lovely kind of violet and purple and pink and orange and salmon colored uh, clouds, you know, would be contrasted to the, you know, the bright uh, primary colors of the electric signage and stuff. And I found that kind of interesting and, and sometimes beautiful, although uh, it shouldn't be construed as, as a reason to promote suburban sprawl. You know, it's out there. It's what we're living in. You know, it's not going to be there the way it is now in 50 years. And people will look back on these paintings if they survive. Uh, people will see a landscape that, uh, that, that looks different from what they're living in. Well, when I first heard that you were a painter, I assumed your paintings were going to be sarcastic. I mean, I, I knew that you were painting about these topics, but they're not, right? No, they're not ironic at all. You know, I'm not trying to make a joke about about it. Um, I'm literally trying to be a straightforward reporter of the landscape of our time in, it, in its many moods. You know, I do like to paint in the evening. I like to paint at night. I, I found one particular strip mall nearby where the supermarket had a particular lighting scheme under the soffit that allowed me to see you know, the colors of my palette and, and, uh, and the canvas very, very clearly while the rest of the stuff around was sort of dark, you know, you could paint the McDonald's in the dark and still see what you're doing. And that was a great boon to me. I also found a lot of satisfaction in the industrial ruins that are all over this area of the upper Hudson Valley. Um, in fact, in the time that I've lived here over the last 30 years, um, a lot of the factories have been bulldozed so that I was able to actually see the process, you know, witness the process of demolition. And um, I, I just bought a book called um, Hudson Valley Ruins, and it's, a, it's an excellent book that goes up and down the Hudson Valley, sort of giving you the history of all these ruins. Many of them are industrial. But, but here's the little nugget I liked. The Hudson River School of Painters, sort of America's first formal school of painting, these artists were lamenting in their day that they didn't have any ruins to paint. Oh, know? absolutely. And, you know, the, the, the figures in that uh, period, you know, Thomas Cole and, you know, Albert Bierstadt and, and Frederick Church and all those guys would uh, go through this initiation rite of traveling all the way to Italy and uh, painting the ruins there as young men. You know, if they'd stay for a year or two or three and they'd, you know, they'd, they'd make their bones by painting the ruins of Rome, and they, then they'd come back to America, and what they finally settled on was the idea that, okay, we don't have ruins here, but we do have this wonderful, romantic, natural landscape. Let's make that our subject matter. And so that became you know, the subject matter of uh, 19th century American landscape painting in the absence of having ruins, uh, and it became a kind of a fetish. The situation is different today. We have a lot of ruins out there, which, and when I go out there, you know, I, I feel very privileged, like... You know, I feel like Thomas Cole might have felt uh, on the Roman Campania, you know, uh, painting the, aque the, the, the disintegrating aqueducts of the Roman Empire. I go out to Clark's Mills by the Hudson River and I paint the, uh, the ruins of the wallpaper factory that are there. And, you know, it's sort of thrilling, you know. And, and it's also a thrilling place to be physically because it, it's a place of nebulous ownership uh, the Georgia Pacific Company actually owns a site, but there's nobody there guarding it anymore. They've given up guarding it. The fences have big holes in it now, so you can get in there. And you know, it's become kind of a strange natural park that has no supervision. But, you know, there hasn't been a whole lot of misbehavior there yet because it, it, it's really in, in sort of a country place. So it's thrilling to be out there alone with an easel uh, by the river. It's starting to get populated, too. There are people who are... Going, going through the fence and fishing along the river. So finally, there's some human figures out there. Speaking of Thomas Cole, one of the painting series you mention in The Geography of Nowhere is... The Course of Empire. Tell us a little bit about that painting series and how it uh, influenced you. Well, I, I don't know that it did influence me. I mean, I, I, I certainly appreciated it, um, although I haven't done anything you know remotely like it. But, well, Thomas Cole, the great American landscape painter and, you know, Thomas Cole was interested in painting series of things. He did one called The Voyage of Life. You know, it was, I think, a four-panel series in which, you know, a young baby starts out in a river in a basket like Moses, you know, floating along the river, and then he becomes a young man, 
uh, in the you know fighting the gales and storms of life, and finally, as an old man, he's delivered into some quiet eddy, you know, where he will uh, be born uh, to heaven by the angels. Um, he has another one called the Course of Empire, which depicts in I think five panels the rise and fall of uh, the Roman Empire, really, although it's never stated. Uh, you know, going from the kind of pastoral phase to the big buildings being built up. And finally, the the climax of it is this uh, huge pageant that's going on and this gigantic kind of amphitheater on the water, you know. It's like a harbor, but it's, there seems to be some great spectacle of empire going on and somebody has just, some someone has just returned from a remote land with giraffes and elephants and, you know, being born on litters and all this stuff. And then, you know, we get a little further and uh, there's nobody there anymore and the buildings are disintegrating and uh, there's some kind of a war that's taken place. It's uh, left a lot of damage, you know. And then finally, you know, the utter desolation of the ruins hundreds of years later. And you can identify, there's like a hill in the background that's in every painting too. Yeah. So you can sort of tell. It's, 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 it's done, the painting, all the panels are done, all the canvases really, I guess, are done from a similar perspective. I don't think they're absolutely identical, but but very similar. And there, yeah, there's a landmark uh, in the background. And it's a quite a tour de force of uh, of painting. Well, the funny thing is that if I were to come up with a, a more recent example of the same thing, I would think of Robert Crumb's a short history of America, right? You know that cartoon series? Oh, it's a fabulous thing, uh, you know, showing the development of a little country road uh, into a small town, into the beginning of the automobile age, and all of a sudden the small town starts to fall apart, and finally it ends up in like the 1980s as a, you know, a pizza hut or a, <laughs> you know, convenience store, you know, surrounded by all this crap of technology, you know, the the horrible broken signage and the telephone poles and the condensers and the 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 electric installations and the trucks and there's all the crap out there. Yeah. But that that's not exactly what your paintings are like though. Are, are you interested in exploring that area a little bit more? Like Well, like I said, I'm you know, I don't have an ironic uh, you know, attitude about it. You think Crumb was being Oh, ironic? absolutely. Well, in the sense that you know, I mean, it, it seemed to be a remarkably straightforward reportage of what was going on there. In fact, in that movie with, with Crumb, they show him drawing that kind of uh, scene and he's sitting there and saying, you know, you can't make this stuff up. You know, you got, you, you have to really pay attention to the details. As soon as he said that, and this is the documentary, I think it's called Crumb. Yeah. Um, I think he mentioned something about how once you start paying attention to transformers in the air and all the wires, it just ruins it. You, that's all you can focus on. And that happened to me for months. That's all I could focus on. There's yeah. so much of that crap up there. That well, you there ignore. is. There is. Uh, you know, when I'm out there painting that stuff, I edit some of it out, but I leave a lot of it in. You know, um, if you if you tried to put it all in, two things would happen. It, it would become as visually illegible as it actually is, <laughs> and you would drive yourself crazy. Yeah. So Jim, you, out there in the uh, in the field painting, um, you ha you had some encounters, right? Isn't there some story of you painting a Burger King? And yeah, I was at a <laughs> yeah, I was doing one of my paintings at a Burger King, and the manager the guy came out. This this young man with a twenty three hair mustache came out and said, "That ain't allowed here." And you know, and I was I wanted to like uh, mess with him <laughs> a little bit, so I said, "You know, what what ain't?" And he said, "That there, what you know." What you're doing there? <laughs> that painting's not allowed, huh? So finally, you know, we went through this for a while, and I was, I was actually, you know, I thought the the situation was so ridiculous that I, 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 I really wanted to uh, uh, have fun with him. So I finally said, "Look, you know, it's just fine with me if you go if you go call the sheriff, <laughs> and he can arrest me for painting at Burger King yeah. on their property. I'm sure that'll be great public relations for your company, you know, because I'll make sure that lots of people know about it." And it'll be real cool. So, do you, do you know that if that actually did happen, it'd probably make the Associated Press wire, and oh, then you'd probably sell that painting for three hundred grand, you know, yeah, on eBay or something. Dude, <laughs> you know, I should have encouraged him. Actually, I, you know, I should have actually uh, uh, been more provocative because then I would have made more money on the painting. Well, Jim, thanks a lot for talking with us about your paintings. No, oh, thank you for being here.
You've been listening to the Kunstler Cast featuring James Howard Kunstler. To leave a listener comment, call toll free at 866 924 9499. Send email to letters at kunstlercast.com. You can listen to all of our past programs, join our email list, find out how to book Jim to speak in your area, and talk about the show with other listeners at kunstlercast.com. I'm your host, Duncan Crary. Thanks for listening. 